To start off with this anomaly right here that we're witnessing, new cases per million the past 30 days is just astounding. Now, obviously, there's no opportunity for a vaccine to kick in or be any benefit. Uh, no one really has an idea why this is occurring. But to put it in perspective, here we are. We have Great Britain. Uh, we have the United States. And we have Sweden. Now, and these, of course, are Asian friends, which have always been kind of on the lower end, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. We'll go through that in a second. But the areas which have been ravaged by basically SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, in multiple areas of the globe, the cases per million, this is the past 30 days, has dropped approximately 50 to 60%, if not greater, at least among this country and many others. We're going to look at Italy as well, too, because the reason being is the United States has done less testing, but in certain cases, many of these countries are actually doing more testing, and there are fewer and fewer positives. No one has a good explanation for this. No one really knows what is happening. It could be antigenic shift. It could be antigenic drift. It could be a myriad of other factors, but obviously with the lockdowns and quarantines, nothing really changes dramatically. This is just astounding. And for those that do not know or realize that are tuning in, Sweden has a very, very uh, minimal pandemic mitigation strategy. That's why we include that as a control. But that's odd and, again, is worthy of explanation. So if any... Uh, Biostatisticians out there, epidemiologists have a good explanation for this incredible drop, which has been totally absent from the media and the news as cases per million. Please explain. Now, there's a caveat to that. Although the cases per million have been dropping precipitously and rapidly, mortality has been going up pretty consistently in correlation, in this case, and there's just a correlation in timing with vaccination. Not saying vaccinations are causing mortality, but it merely makes you weird, get that weird feeling about uh, even though viruses are not alive, they communicate somehow, they try to mutate for survival and transmissibility. It gives you that weird kind of feeling overall. And you'll get an idea about that in a second. But to start off with, let's get right into the not a lot of research. But a lot of interesting data in reference to COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2, for example, like this. And then we'll go back to the data analytics in a second. And I'll show you graphically what I mean by the vaccination and mortality percentage, kind of like going hand in hand. As one goes up, the other one goes up. Curious. But again, correlation, not causative. But to proceed as follows into the research. Now, I know this looks innocuous. But it has to give you a perspective that basically the surgical mask or disposable mask is the new nuclear waste of the 2020s. Why? Can you give me an estimate before you even read it? How many disposable face masks are being used on a daily basis across the globe? Try and guess. Well, let's reveal. This is how many face masks, and this is real important for <laughs> pandemic mitigation because face masks are a source of contamination or a vector, you may say. But however, though, this will put it into true perspective. Right there. 6.8 billion disposable face masks are being used each day across the globe. Now, what I like about this article, it's about converting all these face masks, 6.8 billion on a daily basis, into generally utilizing, um, turning them into two-lane roads. And it takes about 3 million masks, which is obviously they have plenty, uh, to basically produce about a kilometer of a two-lane road. Now, at 6.8 billion, 3 million, you were looking at what, I'm correct me if I'm wrong, 2,200 plus uh, kilometers of road that can be made per day just in reference to disposable face masks and that continue that over a year and some people want to see this pandemic mitigation strategy go on for seven years now but however though 
Get that in perspective. Now, also, too, I want to come back to in a second. As we, guys, I know it's over here. How long do you think a disposable face mask is persistent in the environment? In, a, in more common terms, how long do you think it actually takes one of these disposable face masks, surgical face masks, to basically erode, disappear, you know, they become like it was never there, you know, break down. How many years do you think it takes to take one face mask to break down? We'll get back to that in a second. All right, first is the analytic part, not the analytic part, but some of the reporting. Uh, if we're reference to perspective, number one, uh, Iowa has dropped completely out, looks like, of the, of the COVID pandemic mitigation uh, tactics. As right here, it appears that they are now going to remove all limits, so on and so forth. You can understand why in a second, because if you look at the new infection rate in Iowa, and again, going back to this, something's occurred. We don't know what it is, but that's that's bizarre. But however, though, uh, so Iowa basically had its new cases per 100,000 drop to virtually, you know, flatlined at the x-axis. And so flatline is not a good word, at least forgive me, but you know what I mean. It bottomed out. And so basically, look what's happened. And so they just dropped out. So they're going to become now one of our new controls. So Sweden is a control, Iowa is a control, and Florida is a control. And what we do is we compare those states that we utilize as controls against the states and countries which have uh, used utilized a lot of lockdowns, pandemic mitigation strategies, which can be viewed as being draconian, social distancing, should be physical distancing, and so on and so forth. So now we have more controls to see what's working and what's not working. All right, but to proceed, Sweden, going back to controls. Now, again, Sweden has been criticized for its national pandemic strategy, relaxed, is what they call relaxed national pandemic strategy. But an interesting aspect here is too, a lot of them, there is some reason that's important, uh, I was, we go into this, if I could speak English, at 12 at 3 a.m. at February 7th. 2021, I forgot to mention the date in the beginning, and this is Ralph, for those that do not know, uh, is because even their ICU mortality rate has been amazingly low comparatively uh, to other countries. And for example, like the United States, which they're looking about 35%. So, you know, visitations, people visiting, the mood, the attitude, uh, people not feeling isolated, the human contact, it was extremely important. And so even though Sweden, for whatever reason, was demonized, and you saw the news for quite some time, and any time Sweden had any rise in cases of mortality, the media jumped on to it because looking for some sort of selection bias or confirmation bias to feel good about their own decisions. The unfortunate part about it is, as those that follow this channel, recognize the fact that a lot of pandemic mitigation strategies are being used uh, as a form of weaponized uncertainty. And that weaponized uncertainty being, well, if we didn't do this, it'd be worse. Unfortunately, due to our countries, which are currently using as control up to this point in time, February 7, 2021, that may have been worse. Hypothesis is probably one of the worst of our biases. Primary reason being we're looking at education, hardships financially, so on and so forth, loss of civil liberties, mental health, you name it. Uh, yeah, there are collateral damage to our pandemic mitigation strategies, and if they're not working, that's not cool. All right, to proceed as follows, in the, like the Sweden's ICU uh, mortality rate, still really high, but however, though, compared to our countries, which are, you know, just as advanced, uh, attitude goes a long way. Now, also, too, look at intensive care, just to validate. Uh, looks like, for example, this is UK, and so they ran about 36% compared to Sweden's 23. Let's just say it's as high as 27%. But look at the ICU rate in the beginning of this was almost at 60% until we began to learn. You know, they were throwing everyone on ventilators right off the bat and so on and so forth. We want to get down to the second because there's a nice computer analysis program, which now can predict mortality and who needs a ventilator because the telltale signs are so solid that it's easy to develop a machine learning model to say, hey, this person doesn't stand a good chance if things continue this way. 
But also, too, another interesting thing about Sweden and Denmark and so on and so forth, and it goes into the epidemiology aspect, which I would like to see more of, and I'm only doing this as a entertainment factor. Sweden, for example, is really heavy towards their organic push because they believe organic equates with health as opposed to other areas of the world. And Sweden, for example, is in, I guess, some sort of contest with Denmark and Norway, according to here, and Norway is not doing really good. But however, though, Sweden, for example, is so publicly aware of the benefits of organics that 39% of its public sector, as far as food being distributed, is organic. Can you imagine that? Even Denmark, 22%. Now, you think about it, these healthy behaviors, proactive-wise, could, and, and, uh, could enter some confounding into why, for example, their ICU mortality rates are so much lower. Think about it. Health of the diet and so on and so forth, yeah, that could be that could play a huge role too. Also to why Sweden, even though it has not done anything really as stringent as the pandemic mitigation strategy of the United States or, for example, um, you know, Great Britain, still seems to be outperforming even the countries with the most medieval dark age lockdowns. Come on, seriously. We have been using the same, that's what we did during, you know, the Justinian plague, if you want to go that far back. All right, that is the computer program. And I use this for our statisticians out here. Again, a majority of the public may not understand this, but however, though, it's important for the statisticians to recognize they are coming up with decent programs. Now, this is not to basically say, hey, uh, you know, this person's going to die or whatever it is. But if you have, for example, a program here, look, look at this, can predict with up to 90% certainty whether an individual that – uh, whether an unaffected person who is not yet infected will die of COVID-19. 90% certainty or not if they're unfortunate enough to become infected, if we look at the whole thing there. 90% certainty. When you have factors which are so correlated to where you almost could show that it's a causative relationship and saying, hey, this person has this and this and this and throw it into a program and predict with a 90% certainty. Imagine if you were gambling and you're betting on sport teams or whatever it is, and you had a 90% certainty that your team would win or, or the, which team would win or lose in each basically competition. That's how profound an effect that is. So if you're looking at this right now, and this program was obviously run in uh, Denmark, and they have a 90% certainty, you know, look at the health, don't look at it as a negative aspect. Look at the basically the health pitfalls, which leave an individual susceptible to basically SARS-CoV-2. I'm trying to be as nice as possible. And take the time to mitigate because that's – if you're 90 percent, 9 out of 10, yeah, you could run the bet and go for the 1 out of 10 be the one of lucky ones. But if it's 90 percent, you get the opportunity to change something about BMI or high blood pressure or whatever. If you have that under control, then you have control over your – part of your own destiny. It doesn't mean everyone's going to succeed, but hey, you know what? Why not make the odds a lot better or not as dire? And for example, once admitted to a hospital, COVID-19, a computer can predict with 80% accuracy whether a person will need a respirator. That is a pretty amazing thing too because it helps with hospital uh, allocation of resources to say, hey, this person's coming in. The most likely will need this. They'll need that as opposed to dedicating resources to an individual that may not be fall within the susceptibility of an individual determined by this particular AI program. Yeah, that made any sense whatsoever. But yeah, you get the picture. All right, then moving forward, back to the mass thing. All right, this is an intriguing aspect. So basically, I, the question I asked was just up oh, here it is. How many years does it take for one of these 6.8 billion? 6.88 billion face masks each day to break down. Again, this is the new nuclear waste ish, uh, uh, crisis of we would have never seen coming of 2021 or the 2020s. We'll just say that. Here it is. A single-use face mask of a non-biodegradable plastic, which means they take hundreds of years to break down, let's pie that a little better before I just dropped it off there. What the heck here? Hundreds of years to break down. 
So the mass that you see an individual throw on the ground, and that's what they talk about quite a bit too, because these masks are also incredible vectors for spreading the virus. So the irony is you have a paradox. You want to use the mask in order to prevent disease and spread of contamination, which means it could work really, really well in a lab setting. But this is the argument we've had for a long period of time. But in a real world setting, you know, you're walking by a trash can and we looked at this far as a form of vector and there's a bunch of masks being disposed in that trash can and you have that uh, virus which has a very low micron size, I believe down to three microns now, even though SARS-CoV-2 is below 0.1 microns, uh, that's aerosolized. So you have a, here you are, you have people walking by a trash can and they're throwing the masks in the trash can and there becomes that becomes a vector. And people think, oh, well, all you have to do is, it, again, to stop the inhalation. But no, the people don't understand that SARS-CoV-2 is by social distancing. Ah, gosh, I said the word. Physical distancing is so much more important because it could come in contact with the skin. And here you go. You go to adjust the mask. You're touching by your eyes, your nose, other areas where it could be absorbed. And again, I'm not going to repeat the same thing we've heard over and over again. But still, you know what I mean. Masks are, not, are probably... Unfortunately, people rely too much on them. Let's put it that way. Hundreds of years. Now, interesting aspect too, as far as how much incredible damage, 6.88 billion masks are going to create each day that are never going to break down in many people's lives, lifetimes. Uh, you, to put it in perspective, you could easily say, well, if our founding fathers here in the United States were wearing surgical masks, We'd still be able to find them on the ground today. And so if you look at the breakdown and the significance of the research and so on and so forth, even for them to decontaminate the masks, for example, let's see if I can find here, in a microwave setting or whatever it is, they still have to leave the masks, for example, in the daylight in order to, for, the, for at least one week in order for them to be totally uh, – yeah, check this out. Here it is. Ready? It goes – uh, reuse, suppose, da, 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 da. moist mask be heated in the microwave oven uh, to default capacity 800 watts. This, that, I wanted this to give you an idea how much it takes to decontaminate a mask. So the next time you see someone take their mask and throw it on the ground, whatever it is, and you see a bunch of pile of masks on the sidewalk and so forth, put this in perspective what it takes to decontaminate a, decontaminate a mask. Moist mask have to be heated in a microwave oven at a default capacity of 800 watts for about one minute. It's worth mentioning that the sprayed sides of the mask have to be faced up. The sanitizing method can effectively kill 99.9% .9 of the virus. Reported that dry heat at both 60 degrees centigrade and 70 degrees centigrade for about one hour can ensure the decontamination of the surgical face mask while maintaining its filtering capacity. Now, otherwise, ultraviolet germicidal radiation and hydrogen peroxide plasma can be used for the inactivation of SARS-CoV-2 for mask. To eliminate the risk of exposure to the COVID-19 virus during transportation and construction, it is suggested to keep face masks after the disinfecting in open and restricted area and expose the sun and air for a week prior to just using the masks in pavement construction. And you can go on and on and on and on. And that just gives you a perspective. So again, face masks, 6.88 billion every single day a couple of centuries or so, two or three centuries before that face mask that you wear today will break down. So guess what? M many generations in the future will thank you for the face mask left behind. Again, the new nuclear waste of the 2020s. So let us begin with the data analytics as follows. All right, here we go. Let's start off with the COVID uh, aspect here. And we're going to get into the correlation between the vaccines and rise in mortality. Not saying the rise in mortality due to the vaccines, just a correlation that is so bizarre. Again, the whole, everything's bizarre with the dropping of the uh, infection rate, the rise of mortality rate, and the correlation of the vaccine for reasons which are unknown to us. Just bizarre. All right, so here we go. We're looking at our full world here. All right, new cases smooth per million. There is that drop. Look at that. And you see a very, very slight raise in the line there as far as new deaths per million. Now, keep in mind, this is 4K, and it takes about a week for 4K to fully process. So if this is going to come out clear, please be aware and wait a few days. 
Mortality percentage, here you are, positive decay we got, there's a rise there. Again, look at the rise, look at the drop in new cases, look at the rise. All right, we'll go back down to data, 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 data. Here we are. Look at this. Again, it's tough to not want to uh, interject something called publisher bias, my own opinion. Our objective as far as looking at data is first to observe, then form a hypothesis. And however, though, this is so profound in how it is skipping the media or, I mean, they, I think they became too addicted to the, to the, uh, the panic mode. This is actually can be very positive, but it's like they still want the pandemic mitigation tactics to be in place just in case, I assume. I don't know. Again, publisher buys. Great Britain and Sweden and USA. You notice the drop, precipitous across all boards. They all rise about the same, regardless of uh, whether they had pandemic mitigation strategies in place or not, and they dropped. All right, let's keep on going. So I showed you right off the bat. Deaths per million, we're going back to January 23rd. Uh, Great Britain began to drop. Again, Sweden, so on and so forth. Uh, this is our comparison, again, because this was the Fauci moment where they were trying to compare Sweden to the United States. Still pretty high there as far as new deaths per million going up. United States hit 9.821 new deaths per million. And that's still pretty high as far as the February 5th. Yeah, February 5th, the last reporting date. All right, there's that. And again, let's look at Now, here we are. We're going to compare the United States to all of Asia. Again, it's important to have controls. It's not to be mowing in the United States. But if you're not willing to look at everything, it's what's working, it's what's not working. And that was the biggest mistake they said in reference to our pandemic planning is somehow we decided to isolate each country into its own universe. Not looking at data, what's working, what's not working uh, with other countries, but just to what works within your own country and don't pay attention to anything else. Yeah, I, you're, I already could tell you how I feel about that. All right, here's the United States versus all of Asia. Now what we're doing here, for those not familiar, we're comparing the United States against every single country accumulated. All right, here we are. Total deaths per million. And who is green? Greens, Armenia, pretty close to the United States. But the United States is still the highest out of all of them. And mortality, the United States of all of Asia. Here we are. Are right, we looking at it. Asian mortality. Mortality of all of Asia. We have 378,354 out of a population of 4,463,000,000. Mortality of the United States, 459,555 as of February 5th, I believe. And then population, 329,000,000. Again, you're a data analyst, you're a scientist. You see these numbers. What do you think? What do you do? You want to study what behaviors outside of masks uh, it could be diet, it could be fermented food, it could be green tea, it could be honeysuckle, it could be, you know, a lot of these other things which could be just very innocuous, taking your shoes off before you enter the house. That could be responsible for a population that is basically, have, they have one mortality for every 11,795 people. We've had one mortality for every 715. They have 13 times greater the pop of 13 and a half, 13.56 than the United States in size. Yet, United States being about 13.56 times smaller than competing against all the Asia, if we consider Asia as a country, uh, stuff is not fair anywhere near as well. Why? Why is that? Proceed. Let's go for it. Here's the world. Okay, now we're going to the vaccines. This is where it gets real interesting. All right, people fully vaccinated, Per hundred, and we're working off of the our world and data. I believe it's been being maintained by Oxford University, the OWA data, which is wonderful. Uh, new cases smooth per million, new deaths smooth per million. Here's where the vaccine kicked in. Now again, you don't have enough of the population to make that that type of drop. This is the whole world. Now we're now just looking at basically, you know, our few countries here. As far as we're not looking at Great Britain, the United States, and Sweden, 
we are now looking at the trend across the entire globe. We have this bizarre, precipitous, very rapid drop. Now, remember, we had a steep incline. So this does not mean it can't go back up, but something's afoot. So set up proceed. All right, here we are. We're looking at a small group there uh, in a short period of time. This is where it gets really weird. All right, this is what's called the heat map. For those not uh, familiar, this is looking at correlations. A negative 0.91 pretty much means if the vaccines were in play that you could say the vaccines are stopping new cases smooth per million, if you look at it that way. Now, obviously, it's too early, so this heat map is pretty much going to be misleading. All right. The mortality percentage. People fully vaccinated and mortality. Now, normally, if you had a one, for those not familiar, right here, that you pretty much could say is a causal relationship. Now, obviously, it can't be the case because it's still too early. So what I did is I did a heat map again. And what I did here, if you notice, I did the date, uh, made it a lot of, little smaller, December 14th of 2020. So I didn't have to control everything from the very beginning. And it turned out it's virtually about the same. There's a correlation. Now, I'm going to show you the numbers, not just this correlation figure in a second. All right, looking at this, you know, this mortality percentage to people fully vaccinated. Here's the numbers. Now, look at the numbers real fast. This goes back to January 10th. I just wanted to take this one snippet. All right, this is when people first started getting vaccinated. New cases smooth per million. All right, measure mortality. As we go up, I'm just bringing, I'm arbitrarily picking areas every 10 days. People fully vaccinated. New deaths, smooth per million, basically getting to up. New cases, watch this drop. Pay attention to these two right here. What the mortality percentage is, is we are taking the new deaths, smooth per million, divided by the new cases, smooth per million, and arriving at a percentage. So it's this divided by this to achieve this. So you can do your own figures if you need to. All right, then, because that's how it just plays out. Then we go to, let's say the 30th, 0.13. New deaths smooth per million. New cases smooth per million. Look at this drop. Within 20 days, we went from 93 to 69. Mortality percentage. So at 1.78. 2.59. Then we arrive at today. People fully vaccinated. Our numbers we divide by. Cases moved per million. Mortality percentage. Correlation. Not causative. But it is really unusual when you have the cases dropping. Again, the word precipitously. And yet the mortality percentage is intended to increase. Again, that percentage is taken. New deaths smooth per million divided by new cases smooth per million, arriving at a percentage. All right, and there we are, it's the charts right there. Now, here we look at this. Now, this is mortality percentage. New deaths, new cases per million, I just stressed before. This is the purple, is the fully vaccinated per 100. I'm using this from the, again, OWID data set, our world and data. Look at this. Look at that line when those numbers match. So if you want to do a machine learning model, which we'll look at in a second because I tried to do a regression for predictive analytics. And look at this. And again, I want, to, I want this to sink in. In fact, let's see if we can get this a little, little shorter. Just so I could, so the whole thing could fit in there. And there it is. Look at that. Look at that. Now, remember, this is the date, January 10th to February 5th. And right now, it's February 7th. But that's the last dat uh, data reporting date for them. And that is just astounding. It's confounding. Look at that correlation. So as people get vaccinated, I'm not saying it's causal, the deaths, 
But at the same time, too, if you want to use causal, you could say, well, people are fully vaccinated and the transmission rate's going down. You could say it's the vaccine's uh, benefit for that as well. But obviously, it's not because it's too early. Just a correlation. Makes you really, again, think about the sentient, the sent, sentient behavior of things we don't consider alive, like viruses, to proceed forward. This is where we're looking at the correlation. This is our data. Mortality percentage, people fully vaccinated. And then what I'm doing right here is I'm running a predictive model. So if you see these things right there, ba ba ba. This is the information used for exploratory or explanatory data. Exploratory. And then this is the predictive model. Now, obviously, it can't go this far but because it's too early in the game. But this is, again, the people fully vaccinated data and generally to mortality percentage. And if you were, if this was, if we had enough information to actually draw a solid model, which I don't believe we do, that means as you get towards point, because I think there's got to be a drop off, 0.25% of the population globally being vaccinated, you would think that a mortality rate would be at 3.2. I hope not. I hope it begins to drop. But according to regression and scatter plots, you know, showing and so forth and everything else like that, predictive analytics with a very basic, very, very basic regression model in my very amateur way to do it, that's what we would run if we had enough data to make a good judgment call. But 20 days worth of data, that's still kind of early. All right, let's get back into regular uh, other stuff. Blah, blah, blah. Investigative correlations, let's begin here. All right, let's look at here. This is our basically heat map. I should include uh, people fully vaccinated per 100. It hasn't shown up as yet, so it's basically not a number. But you can, again, look at our uh, correlations here. Like, for example, 0.75 human development index means chances are the higher it is, more likely you have people over the age of 70 and the median age. But, for example, I keep on pounding this out each time. Female smokers, 0.77, uh, 70 or older. That does, that's interesting. But if you look at the age 70 or older, and age does play a role if there's other other comorbidities. It appears that age alone is not just a factor. There's going to be other things to play, it appears. Because you look at age 70 or older, and you look at new death smooth, you do play a role, but not strong enough to say it's causative on its own. Uh, no, actually, sorry, I take that back. It's 0.063. So if you're looking at, at this heat map based on what we have at the age, no, doesn't doesn't seem to play a role at all. Uh, but let's keep on going. You can look at it if you want, pause it, whatever it is, a little bit later on. There's that. Again, one means direct relationship. Like a, a, being seven year older definitely correlates with being seven year older. Life expectancy being seven year older definitely plays a role with being seven year older. And so on, meeting age. You can see the the, the basic no does stuff. But as far as cases per million, uh, total deaths per million, the more so, new deaths smoothed, not so much now. Uh, just to play a role. Again, look more data, data. Remember we did this a long time ago. We we're trying to find correlations in reference to life expectancy, uh, uh, case mortality. So I'm going to run through all this real fast just for the sake of time. Here's all the countries doing better than the United States. Again, not to be more than the United States. When we first started this, the mortality rate of the United States was 3.6 uh, new deaths per million. Now it is at, again, 9.8, 9.78, uh, depending on the data source you're using. I think I'm using COVID tracking for this one. These are all the countries doing better than the United States as far as mortality rate. Going all the way up and down the line. So again... Freeze it if you need to, but that's exactly the where it is. Uh, where they have different definitions of mortality in reference to, you know, you know how we decide find if someone has COVID nineteen or detects SARS COV dash two, but they have other comorbidities, uh, but they happen to have that. Are we classifying that as the the, the cause of death or contribution to the death? You know, little uh, bookkeeping issues like that that make you wonder. All right, to proceed forward, 9.72. These are our countries. Again, people are going to look, well, they don't have reporting, whatever it is. But again, data is data. So you take it for what it's worth. Uh, and oh, yeah, don't look at that. That's a bunch of numbers. That's, I'm, I'm messing around with um, uh, basically different uh, described methods and statistical methods. All right, but however, proceed forward. Masks. Just go right down the line. All right, 
Now, we did this before because trying to show if masks have any correlation with anything in reference to prevention. And this is only looking at masks and not stringency index or so on and so forth. And da 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 da. Yeah, so our data is, let's see, as of February 1st, I assume. So looking at our mask level, should be reporting. So looking at February 1st. I thought we were, yeah. So depending on the place, so February 6th, 2021. So we do have that right there. The medical data, but the mass data was last reported February 1st. All right, so look at it. We go down the line here. Let's see if any countries change their status. Here, here we are. Heat map. Facial coverings. Obviously correlate with people wearing facial coverings. New death smooth. Total deaths per million. Uh, let's just do it this way. New cases smooth per million. New test smooth per million. Need a 0.7 to be strong. Uh, ICU patients per million. Hospital patients per million. Uh, deaths per million. Again, you draw the line. For example, you can see ICU patients per million and new deaths per million correlate pretty strong. Hospital patients per million and new deaths per million correlate pretty strong. But again, you just can't use selection bias to pick and choose your data. If masks are this weakly correlated, you know, you know, I don't know why it became such a contention of uh, people's behavior towards each other, whether they're nice or not. All right, so here we are. These are the countries which are obviously doing a four, which means mandatory. And these are countries doing a three. These are countries doing a two. These are countries doing a one. We'll read the information there. Zero, no policy. Venatu, Tanzania. Did they just uh, they just went down to a zero or did they start reporting? Nicaragua. And ironically, we Sweden, for example, was a one. So that means it's recommended but not required. And Japan, for example, one. So these places you think are not, it's actually interesting. Let's go down. Uh, mass level four, I'm gonna just run through it real fast. There's that precipitous drop across the United States in cases per million. Obviously mass didn't play a role much in that because we had a, f now keep in mind too, not every place in the US, for example, like Iowa and Florida are, are going like bonkers over wearing masks. So you can't really say, I don't know why the Oxford University, uh, oh, it is still gets classified a mask as a four, when I think they should have to do something to show an average between states or at least population mandates. The United States, now here's the key. Now a lot of people say, well, the cases must be going down because testing may be going down. That could be the correlation for the United States. But however, though, that's not the rest of the world. So let's keep on going. Look at Sweden. All right, purple is the cases per million. Red's the test, not the best example. All right, so let's keep on going, let's keep on going. Japan, there you are, the red is the test. Purple is the cases. Look at the drop. That's one of our Asian friends, which they tend to have very low uh, infection rates of the COVID-19 to begin with. Let's keep on going. You see this little, this little spread there. That's even New Zealand. Finland's not a great example. They correlate directly pretty strongly. India, look at this difference. Testing, cases, that's India. Look at that separation. Purple is cases per million. Red is the number of tests. That's what we're seeing more places than any place else. Look at that, cases per million in Spain. Obviously we have an exception. But not all, that one averaged out with the rest of the world. France, a little bit of separation. United Kingdom. Look at this. Test per thousand, case per million. Italy, even greater. It, test per thousand, case per million. So you can't say that the cases are dropping because there's lack of testing. That's the, what we're trying to bring into uh, fruition here, that's, that to eliminate that as a part of the confounding or something that could basically cloud your judgment for those which are not aware what confounding is. But that's what we're looking at. And then data, data, data. All right, let's go by our states. Now, since we have, oops, let me go to the top here. Since we have Iowa now dropping out of the pandemic lockdown game, uh, so I'm going to use Iowa as a comparison now with California and New York. 
on the cases per million bases or cases per 100,000 bases. So I'm going to scroll down. I'm just going to go straight. There we are. California, Florida, Iowa, New York. Iowa is right about down there. And that's positive per 100,000. New York is higher. Florida is down. Okay. Again, your objective as a witness to this is to say, hey, these two states, New York and California, with all the pandemic lockdowns and strategies and businesses closing and so on and so forth, and Iowa and Florida basically opening up, and knowing the collateral damage that these lockdowns do cause, I mean, not just economically, but psychologically, are they really doing anything? Does the argument really hold true to say, well, if we didn't do it, it would be a lot worse when we use other states as a control? Again, you be the judge. Uh, here we are. Let's look. The do, 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 do. Mortality increase. Well, that's pretty low off the bat. Positive per 100,000. I think we went kind of like that. Uh, breaking up into a little bit of area here from January 4th, which that's when the vaccines really start to come into play in Iowa. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a, a snippet. There's California, there's blue, and there's Florida. Again, not as a competition which one's doing better or worse, but on a mean or average, so to say, are the lockdowns really doing anything? You had to make a case for lockdowns. Could you? Could you make a case for lockdowns when comparing it against other states which are doing very little? Doesn't mean things can't change, but based upon the data which is currently available, if you were a leader of these states, what decision would you make for your population? Deaths per 100,000. Iowa went up a little bit, then down. But again, you only have 3,180,000 people. Uh, so keep that in mind. And so there's New York. Death increases. Da, da, da. Positive increases per 100,000. You already got the colors down. Hospitalizations per 100,000. Florida's down here. Iowa's down here. California. New York. I don't have to say anything. All right, there's that. Da, 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 da. There's the states. There's a positive increases per state. So on and so forth. All right, next. Hospital occupancy. So your governor saying, well, we have to lock things down because of hospital occupancy rates. All right, here's our total inpatient beds. California, comparatively, inpatient beds used. And then remember, this is across the entire board, and there could be manning issues and so on and so forth. Um, so here we are, and I think the data set we're using for that is um, HHS, hhs.gov. Data set's important, so you know where it comes from. Total IC beds, IC beds are being used estimate is California. Red line is 72%. Hospitals normally operate at 72% occupancy of ICU beds. All right, so here's our people in, with COVID. Uh, California, Arizona, Georgia, da 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 go all the way down the line. And so here we are. We're below, I guess, 78% inpatient bed utilization uh, for California. And so, again, you make your judgment call. Looks like everyone's, which is really weird because look at this. We're dropping pretty low on inpatient bed utilization. And so... Just a note, and orange is your ICU units. Uh, da, 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 that looks too confusing. Let's keep on going down, 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 down. There's the columns we're using. California, if this was an EKG, that's what it looked like. Uh, inpatient beds being used with COVID, beginning to drop. Now, again, what can happen here is a lot of elective surgeries could start coming into play. So all because you see inpatient beds uh, being used going up, the COVID going down, means a lot of people have cancer surgeries and heart surgeries and so on and so forth are finally getting that opportunity to get in and have those procedures done. And so don't let this inpatient bed thing fool you when you start seeing this. There we go. New York, Florida, uh, inpatient beds used for COVID. Again, really weird considering the fact that basically Florida dropped out of the pandemic lockdown game for the most part, a while ago. And if not, the media is, remember the media, whatever the media is, I don't know what the media is actually, just a bunch of people on TV saying stuff. But they all said Florida is going to come to an end. And they all, again, they did the same thing with Sweden. That desire to see people that veer from the path fail, when they're actually reality, they end up being trailblazers 
because you you feel comfortable in in your decision based upon uh, what may happen. I'm trying to be nice. Is not leadership. No, leaders aren't the people that run from the front line. Leaders are people that run to the front line. Think about that. All right, let's go down. Here's our numbers here across the board. I see beds. You wanted to see the numbers there as a whole. Uh, the da, da, dates, times, the do, and we go down to the last one, vaccine distribution. And I know the vaccine rates appear to be very, very low. But however, though, the vaccines are being distrib distributed, at least if we go by the, the second dose. And we're getting our data from the cdc.gov. So here we go. And our data, these are the total, the, the columns we're focusing on are these total right here. And so this is the week of February 8th, so we're current. And so if we look at basically the line there, uh, that's a little blinding, so I'll fix that. Complete vaccine administ uh, administration. If the second dose, if all these dosages, the dosages, if, the, if they were not being destroyed and people forget to turn off fridges and things like that, if these dosages, doses, were actually making it to a person's arm, considering that the vaccine does do exactly what they say, then this should be the amount administered uh, for the public as a whole. This is why vaccines, I'm saying, don't play a role necessarily directly in prevention of cases and so on and so forth at this stage of the game because it's so marginal. So if everyone was vaccinated by the second dose, if they're all distributed perfectly, this would be your rate 11.4, 23.83, Alaska, uh, District of Columbia, so on and so forth, Utah, New York. I have no clue what the heck happens in New York, 6.73, uh, and so on and so forth. If that's, if ever, that's what, That would be in a perfect world. And so I go down, down, down. I see bed utilization, uh, percentage I see bed utilization there. Inpatient bed utilization, ICU bed utilization, and vaccine level. So again, this is percentages. And so, for example, here we have California. The ICU bed uh, is a little higher. Uh, inpatient bed utilization is a little lower, as we pointed out, about 79%. And these are the, the vaccine levels. So we're looking forward to see a drop. And we, it looks like we are seeing a drop, but I don't know if it's happening per, because of this. But we'll see a rise in mortality. Now, this is a confounding factor. What if they're vaccinating the people which are really, really ill and they're not responding well? And that's why we have a rise in mortality in correlation with the rise in vaccination. Food for thought. Scroll down, scroll down. This is that vaccine distribution across the board. And that is it. A little bit earlier tonight than anything else. So if we look at the data that we covered real fast, we want to look at basically... Well, the main thing to look at really is what are we going to do with all these masks? 6.8 billion disposable face masks per day, highly infectious, not just with SARS-CoV-2, but think about it, all the other diseases that people can carry that they would not normally leave. Put it this way. If people took a bunch of tissues from after a cold and threw them on the ground, the perception in our mind would be a lot different and a lot less accepting where people take a face mask or surgical mask and leave it on the ground. It's really weird because we see surgical masks as being clean and sanitary, but if someone had a dirty tissue and threw it on the ground, oh, it's the same thing. It's the same type of impact, except you see what it takes to disinfect a uh, face mask. 6.8 billion disposable face masks used across the globe each day, and it only takes about... Do, 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 do. For a single-use face mask made of non-biodegraded plastic, hundreds of years to break down in the environment. Hundreds of years. I'm thinking a couple of hundred. Hundreds of years. Every face mask. So again, hopefully this individual comes up with a creative way to deal with the new nuclear waste of the 2020s. And we can be driving upon our old face masks over time, 6.88 billion per day. And then, of course, we look at the intensive care units for Sweden, da da da, much lower, da da, yeah, 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 Sweden's doing great. Again, I don't like seeing people in ICUs alone and in isolation. And I just want people to look, uh, 
you know, open their eyes saying, you know, well, because someone says something with confidence doesn't mean they're right. And that's what we have controls. And the controls are showing we could be a little uh, more open to human contact. Um, basically, that down, we look at that. Organic food, I just threw in there for fun. Uh, computers are getting so good at detecting who will succumb to coronavirus or not, or I should say SARS or COVID-19, whatever we call it these days. Uh, Iowa is no longer playing, and again, a great data source if you ever need to is COVID-19, which I use. And you can find all the information as far as vaccine comparisons uh, from there as well. Wonderful, wonderful data source. COVID tracking is a great data source as well. CDC, HHS, DOG, GOV, doing a really good job too. Um, and so I wanted to show real fast, see if they have it here. I like how it's all coming up. Uh, you see right there, United States, they're showing 2.24% of totally, uh, totally being vaccinated. And But if we look at our data and we look at our distribution, these should be the vaccine levels if those second shots were making into their arms. So the vaccine being distributed to the states and the vaccine data of those being fully vaccinated being reported is five times worse than potentially it should be. Again, Ralph signing off. Hope you find this information of use. Data source will be there. I'll put a link to a few of the articles. Again, apologize, not a lot this week. But again, food for thought. Um, and just take it from there. See you guys all later on. Look forward to seeing you all on Tuesday, and if not, by next week on Saturday. Catch you in a bit. Bye. I got to find the off button. There it is. Yay.